All right, amen. So I invite you to take your Bibles if you have them with you this morning, and we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 40, so we, we had our introduction to our series in Isaiah 40 through 55 a couple of weeks ago when we looked at Isaiah chapter 6, and then we took a quick break last week for Father's Day, and now we're going to pick up with our with the main body of the series. And this morning we are in Isaiah chapter 40. And one, one interesting little tidbit um, is that it was a year ago today that I, me and Sarah first came up here and I preached my candidating sermon when you all guys, when you guys all voted to get yourself into this mess. So... <laughs> Just thought you'd want to be reminded of that. <laughs> Amazing the changes that can happen in a year. I want to ask you, please, would stand with me for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read Isaiah chapter uh, 40. I'm going to read verses. I'm going to read verses 9 through 18. Isaiah 40, 9 through 18. This is God's holy word for us, his people. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span? Enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? And taught him knowledge? And showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. And are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not be sufficient or would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? This is God's holy and inspired, powerful living word for us as people. Let's ask him to bless our time in his word today. Father, we do ask that you would bless not only the reading of your holy, God-breathed scriptures, but you would bless and empower now the preaching of that word. Write your eternal truth upon our hearts, and may the truth of your word and the power of that word show itself in our lives as we are conformed a little more this morning into the image of of your perfect Son, our Savior Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Two weeks ago, we saw in Isaiah 6 that the whole earth is filled with God's glory. And as we gather outdoors for worship in the park, we're surrounded by the constant chorus of creation, calling out day and night the wonder and majesty of our God. That divine glory is central to who God is. It's at the very heart of all He does. 
Absolutely everything God does is for His glory. For His, or for the sake of His name and for the purpose of His praise. Ephesians 1.11 Therefore the glory of God must be the heart and aim of all that we are and all that we do. If the earth is filled with His glory, and if the heavens proclaim His praises day and night without ceasing, if all creation was made by Him and for Him, Colossians 1.16, and if all things exist for His honor and glory, Revelation 4.11, then surely you exist for the same purpose. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That includes everything from my next sip of water to the next few words I have to say to the way you sit and listen to a sermon to the way we eat our lunch later to the way we talk to each other. Absolutely everything, Paul says, do it all in a way that God gets glory. Everything in your life ought to be oriented towards the glory of your great God. He should be the blazing center around which your whole life revolves. You were made by Him. You were made for Him. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name whom I created for my glory. That's what you were made for. To see his glory. To sing his glory. To be to the praise of his glory. Now this should be familiar for good Presbyterians, for Reformed Christians. We talk a lot about the glory of God. But I wonder how many of us really understand it. So suppose I gave you a pop quiz. Matt, hand those out. No, no, no. no. (laughs) Suppose I gave you guys a pop quiz this morning and asked you to answer the following three questions. Think about how you do. Question one, what is the glory of God? Question two, how does God reveal His glory? Question three, for what purpose does God reveal His glory? Why does He reveal His glory? Isaiah says in verse five of our text, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. God's glory, based on this verse, is something you see. It's something you perceive, recognize, observe. Glory is something that God shows you about Himself. It is revealed. The glory of God is the outshining splendor of all His perfections. God puts His perfections on display for you to see. That's His glory. God has all this infinite perfection in Himself, and He could keep that private and never show you any of it. But what He does is He goes public with all that inner perfection, holiness, majesty, and He puts it on display. It's His inner holiness gone public. The glory of God is the outshining splendor of all His perfections. And these perfections are on display through God's wondrous works in both creation and providence. Creation, providence, and redemption. Psalm 19.1, we read a minute ago, the heavens are telling the glory of God. Psalm 19.2 says, day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Creation reveals knowledge of God. And in Isaiah 40, God's glory is something He reveals not just in general through creation, 
but also in more special and specific ways when God acts for the comfort of His chosen people. Verse 1 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. So here are the answers to our pop quiz. Question one, what is the glory of God? Answer, the glory of God is something he reveals about himself. The bright, shining radiance of all his perfections. Question two, how does God reveal his glory? Answer, this revelation comes through God's wondrous and magnificent works as the creator of all things and as the redeemer of his chosen people. So what God does as creator and what God does as your redeemer puts his perfection and his glory on display. It reveals it so that you can know who he is. Question three then, what's the purpose? Why does he reveal his glory? Answer, the purpose for which God shows us his glory is for our everlasting comfort, which can only be found in having this glorious creator as our glorious Redeemer. This is what Isaiah 40 is all about. As we consider this passage of Scripture this morning, we will see God's glory unfolded before our very eyes. The three questions of our pop quiz correspond to the three sections of this chapter. Section 1 shows us that God the Redeemer in verses 1 through 11. Section 2 shows us God the Creator, verses 12 through 26. And section 3 shows us what it means to have this God as our God, verses 27 to 31. So let's now turn to the text and let's ask the Lord during these next moments in His Word. Let's ask Him to open the eyes of our hearts that we might see His glory more clearly and reflect it more fully in our lives. So first, the glory of God the Redeemer in verses 1 through 11. Isaiah chapters 40 through 55 addresses the period of Israel's exile from the land. Many are in captivity in Babylon. Some were left behind in Israel and some have begun to return to the land. Israel fell into idolatry. They practiced iniquity. They piled up sin on upon sin in rebellion against the Lord. And though God sent prophet after prophet to warn, to rebuke, to call Israel, turn from your sin, return to your God, they refused. They persecuted the prophets. They resisted every invitation, every summons to repent and believe. So God raised up Israel's enemies And sent them to make war upon his people in judgment for their covenant-breaking apostasy. He raised up first the Assyrians to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. And when the rebellion continued, when they still didn't learn from that, he raised up the Babylonians to conquer the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 B.C. Jerusalem was demolished. The temple was destroyed and the people were decimated and dispersed among the Babylonian Empire. The Israelites were crushed. They were a broken, defeated people. They were in desperate need of comfort from their God. And in response to the dark days of exile, God answers his people's plight by sending a proclamation of comfort and a herald of good news, verses 1 through 11. So first, this proclamation of comfort. The chapter opens with God telling Isaiah what to say in verses 1 and 2. Look what it says. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Isaiah is told to speak tenderly to God's people and to comfort them with this proclamation of comfort. Say, her warfare is ended. 
Tell my people that my judgment does not last forever. Tell Jerusalem that the days of vengeance have passed. The days of war have ended and the day of rest has come. Say her iniquity is pardoned. Tell my people that their iniquity has been put away. Though it was heaped up to heaven, it has been put away. All their transgressions of my law, all their many violations of my word, it's all forgiven. Though you are a prisoner in Babylonian captivity, you are no longer a slave to sin. Though you are a covenant breaker condemned to die, I have set you free from the covenant curse and released you from the sentence of death that my law demands. Her iniquity is pardoned. Pardon is something that the governor does for someone on death row, someone in jail, someone condemned. You are released. Say, she has received double for all her sins. Tell my people that although my justice demands that you perish from the face of the earth for your sins and be cast body and soul into hell, for your great iniquity against me, where sin abounded, grace much more abounds. Romans 5.20 I have repaid you double for all your sins. Though you have been banished into exile, I will give you back double grace. Grace that not only pardons your iniquity, grace that not only puts away your sins, but grace that gladdens your souls with eternal comfort. As Isaiah 61.7 puts it, Instead of your shame... There shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. What a glorious proclamation of comfort that redounds to the glory of God. And now the herald of good news. This first section of the chapter, verses 1 through 11, it ends in verses 9 through 11 now with a herald of good news. It says, this part is what we read earlier in our scripture reading. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold your God. This is the name of our series because this is what Isaiah 40 through 55 is all about. He's trying to get his people's attention. Look at your God. Behold your God. This is a herald of good news, which is what the word gospel means. This is a gospel preacher. This is a proclamation of the gospel. What is this message of the gospel? What is this news that you and I proclaim when we share our faith? It's behold your God. Oh, Christian, God is the gospel. Not all these other implications and benefits, all the problems in your life he can fix for you on down the line. Yeah, those things are great. Those things can come. That's not the gospel, though. Oh, you're lonely? Here's a friend. Oh, you're broke? Here's a money-making savior. Oh, you're whatever. Fill in the blank. You're missing this in your life. Jesus can come fill that hole. But the problem is that the focus is on the thing and not on the one who gives. On the gift and not the giver. God is the gospel. Behold, your God is the message. This great redeemer, mighty to save, glorious in his saving might. Behold him. Behold your God. In the New Testament, this whole section, verses 1 through 11, it's all fulfilled, we're told, in the coming of Christ, the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to fetch the one, who knows his flock by name, who lays down his life for the sheep, who carries his tender lambs in his loving arms and holds them close to his heart. 
Behold your God, Christian. Look unto Jesus and see his glory. Look unto Jesus and be saved all the ends of the earth. Behold, the Lord God comes with his might and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Oh, behold the glory of God, the Redeemer in Christ. That's section one of the chapter. Second section of the chapter, verses 12 through 26. In this section, Isaiah now steps back. He sort of pans back from this special work of redemption by God's saving grace, which is revealed in the gospel. He zooms out from redemption and scales back to behold all creation. In the first section, Isaiah is looking through the microscope of special revelation at the wondrous works of redemption for God's people. But now in this section, he turns his gaze upward to the heavens and he looks through the telescope of general revelation at the wondrous work of creation. In verse 21, Isaiah says, Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Isaiah says here in this, past, in this verse, verse 21, he tells us that we can discern the glory of God and learn the knowledge of God both from the nature of the world that he has made, and from the history of the world that he rules. We can learn about God and see his glory through creation, the nature of his creation, and the history of his creation. From the beginning, in verse 21, refers to the history of the world. And from the foundations of the earth refers to the nature of the world. And Paul confirms that we're on the right track here in Romans chapter 1 when he says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And so all of us are without excuse for not seeing it. Paul says. Well, Lord, if you had just made it a little more plain, I've listened to videos where atheists have been asked, why don't you believe in God? Well, there's just no evidence. And they say, well, what about these 21 arguments for the existence of God? Well, when I get to heaven and I stand before the Lord, if there's such a thing, I'm going to say, not enough evidence. You should have made it a little plainer. I've heard atheists say that. And he's just going to say, Romans 1's been around a long time, fella. And it says, not only can you see it, not only is it plenty of evidence, but you have seen it and didn't like it and so closed your eyes to it. You don't get to say, well, I didn't know the gun was loaded. You don't get to say you didn't have enough evidence. You don't get to say you couldn't see it. Having your eyes shut is no excuse for not seeing because you can open them. This text says God is showing his glory to everybody. Believer, unbeliever, doesn't matter. It's on display through creation that surrounds us this beautiful Lord's Day morning. So what are these invisible attributes Paul talks about of God's eternal power and his divine nature? What are these things that God has revealed and made known to us through the nature and history of creation? Well, Isaiah gives us this beautiful sample in this second section of chapter 40. And we can't linger on these because it's, each, each of these could be a whole sermon by itself. I just want to highlight what he says. He gives us three snapshots of what God is like, what we can know about his glory as creator. First, he says, God is the infinite, independent, all-knowing designer of the universe. This is the good stuff, guys. The infinite, independent, all-knowing designer of the universe. Look at verses 12 and 14. In verse 12, he says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? 
and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. The picture Isaiah gives is of a a master craftsman in his tool shop. In his workshop, with his tools, he's got his, he's got his ruler, his measure, his span. He's got his measuring devices. All right, I need this much dust for the earth. And let's see, heavens are going to be that, that length, that width, that breadth. Okay, there's the universe, perfect. And you can see him in his workshop crafting universes, worlds. Like it's nothing the way you would work on a piece of wood. He is the designer, the craftsman of the mind-bogglingly huge universe that's out there. He measures the universe. But then verse 13 says, even though God measures the universe, everything that's created, everything that's not God, God measures it and makes it. Verse 13 said, says, who has measured him? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? There isn't a ruler big enough. (laughs) There is no measuring device. Nothing science could ever dream of doing will ever be able to measure him, to trace him out, to pin him down, to say, ah, now we have the God-shaped box that we can put him in and we've got it all figured out. Here's God from A to Z. No, no one can measure him. He's infinite. He's boundless. He has no limit. Verse 14 says he is independent of his creation. He does not need us for a thing. Verse 14, whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who's God's teacher? Who helped God figure some stuff out? Oh, here's how you make stars and here's how you make mitochondria and the bacteria and... Cells and here's what sheep are supposed to do and here's what a finger is. Who taught him understanding? Who gave him all these ideas about creation? It says, who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge? Who showed him the way of understanding? Answer, nobody. Nobody ever could. This is the conversation that Job had with God. Where God's like, okay, when I made the morning, where were you? Comets, where were you for that one when I thought of comets? Galaxies? Job didn't know anything about galaxies. He just knew stars. We know about billions of galaxies that are full of billions of stars. God knew all about those things. He knows how to make universes. He doesn't need you to tell him what he should be doing in his creation, what he should have done, or anything else. Who taught him the path of justice? Nobody gets to tell him what's right and wrong. He tells you what's right and wrong. He's the standard, not us. He's independent. He's infinite. He knows everything. He designed everything. This is the good stuff, guys. This is God, the creator. Second sample Isaiah gives us. God is the almighty, all-worthy ruler of the nations. Verses 15 through 17. In verse 15, it says he is so high and so much greater than the nations that they're like a drop of water in a bucket. Verse 15, behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Whenever you go in your house and you're, and you're wiping down the furniture, gets dust on it, and you just wipe the dust away, does the dust put up a fight? I mean, does it, is it hard? I mean, yeah, it floats back down. You've got to do it again later. Not every, not every analogy has, is perfect. <laughs> but it's God's analogy, so we're going to stick with it because it's in Isaiah. But when you wipe dust away, it's gone. Like it, it doesn't put up a fight. It doesn't resist. God says the nations of the world are that to him. Particles of dust. Roman Empire. <whistles> Babylonian Empire. He just takes a rag and wipes them out. No problem. And just name the nation. Name this one. We're dust before him. Dust on a scale that he puffs and we're gone. That's all we are to him. Don't get any ideas that we need him or that we can stand up to him. He's almighty. 
all the glory and power of nations combined are just dust. Verse 16 says he's all worthy. He's worthy of more worship than we could ever give. It says that Lebanon, the whole country of Lebanon, full of all of these mighty cedar trees, it says Lebanon would not suffice for fuel. You could chop down all the forests and pile them up for one big burnt offering to God and offer all the animals in the world. It says, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. Pile up all the wood and all the animals and make one big massive worldwide sacrifice to God and it wouldn't come close to what he's worthy of. Our highest, best, purest praises are just, just shy of blasphemy. He's that high above us. And he's worthy of that much. He's worthy of more worship than we could ever give. More than we could ever tell. More than we could ever imagine. He's worthy because he's the creator. Verse 17 says that he is the ruler of the nations. All nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. Emptiness. The Hebrew word for emptiness is the same one that's used in the beginning in Genesis when it says that the world was without form and void. Without form and empty. The nations are nothing before him. They are the clay in his hands. And he rules them and shapes them as he sees fit. God is the almighty, all-worthy ruler of the nations. And I hasten on now to the third that he mentions. God is the only living and true God, the sovereign monarch over all creation, verses 18 through 26. We won't take time to go through the whole section, but I'll summarize it like this. In verse 18 which is where we stopped reading this morning. It says, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? And the first words of verse 19 are, An idol? Who are you going to compare with me? An idol? What? And hear the outrage. An idol? I fashion universes and you take a piece of wood and carve it into a figurine and sit it on your mantle or in your temple and bow to it? You're going to worship something you made when I made you and it and everything else? This is the outrage that God has at the folly and foolishness of idolatry. Idols don't do anything, but God is living and true, and powerful, and active. Verse 21, Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth on his throne, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. And spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Idols are not the true God. Yahweh is the true God. The God of Israel. The God of Jesus is the true God. And he is sovereign over all things. Enthroned on high. Ruling and reigning without any rivals to his throne. And so note the double conclusion of this section. Verse 18 says, To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? And then verse 25 repeats it, To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. And now we're back to two weeks ago. Holy, holy, holy. There's no one like the Holy, Holy, Holy One. The Holy One has no equal. He who is holy, holy, holy is uniquely perfect, perfectly unique. He's utterly incomparable. There is no one and no thing like our glorious God. This is the one who made us. This is the one who redeemed us in Christ. This is the one who comes to us in Jesus Christ through the incarnation and goes all the way to the cross and from the cross to the tomb and from the tomb to the heavens at the right hand of the Father all to rescue you from corruption and eternal death. 
This is the God who made all things good in the beginning. And this is the God who remakes you into the good and glorious image of His beloved Son. Behold your God, Christian. This is your Creator and your Redeemer. This is the glory of the Lord your God. O oh, worship and adore the God of glory and of grace today. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-three: 23. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him. And stand in awe of Him, all you offspring of Israel. Psalm 33, 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Now finally, we conclude with the third section of Isaiah 40, verses 27 to 31. In verse 27, God's people express their skepticism. Skepticism. After all, they are still in the same ruinous state that they were in when the chapter started. Exile, hopelessness. Now they've received this proclamation of comfort and this herald of good news from point one. And they've been reminded of how great and awesome their God is as creator and redeemer, point two. And they've been told this so that they might have trust and confidence and comfort in God's word. And yet, they look around at their lives and the state of their world, and they doubt. And they doubt. They say in verse 27, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. You can feel the hopelessness there. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Isaiah, but my way's hidden from the Lord. He's not paying attention to me. Not in the sense of he's not looking, so what can I get away with? But he's not paying attention to me. Look, look at the state I'm in. I'm being disregarded by God. He has closed his eyes to me. Look at my life. Look at my friends' lives. Look at my family. Look at my job. Look at my situation. Look at my finances, my marriage, my kids. And he's forsaken me. Look at this world we're in. Look at the nonsense yeah, I hear what you're saying, Isaiah, but I have my doubts. Can you relate to that this morning? Do you look at your life and the situations and circumstances you have to face and question the goodness of God for you? Do you look at the do you look out at the confusion and chaos of the past couple of years or maybe the past couple of weeks? in our country or in your neighborhood, and you doubt. You doubt the greatness of God. If so, this text is the word of God for you today. Isaiah says the everlasting God, in verse 28, does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable, it says. And that means God is not worried he is not tired. He never gets exhausted ruling his world. He never lets things get out of his control. And even when it doesn't seem like it, he knows exactly what he's doing. As we sang earlier, and though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. And this all-powerful, all wise, never failing, never fainting God, the glorious creator and gracious redeemer. He has pledged himself by covenant in Christ's blood on the cross to be your God and to treasure you as his people. Even though you and I grow faint and weary, he never does. And he promises that he will supply you with his all-sufficient strength to carry on in your weakness. As Paul said, in my weakness, the strength of Christ is on display. I am made strong with the strength that he gives. So I rejoice in my weakness so that the strength of Christ can be seen. And I don't, 
I don't have to walk around and with the false joy of being prideful. I get to go around this life with the true joy of getting to say thank you to the Lord. Verse 31, last verse of the chapter. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, your God will sustain you, Christian. His promise is sure. Verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Though it may not appear so now, Christian, He will show up and He will show you His glory. In the meantime, He calls you to wait upon Him, to trust in Him alone, and to find out for yourself that He is a faithful creator and a perfect redeemer. This is the glory of the Lord, revealed in the wondrous works of creation and redemption for the purpose of His eternal praise and your everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do give you the glory that you deserve. And oh, that we could give you more. Oh, that we could give you just one hour of our lives when it can be truly, authentically said of us that we worship you and love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh God, what would even an hour feel like if I could do that? What would even one Lord's Day worship service be like if we could just do that one good time? Oh, what joy might we feel? Oh, what sin might we let go of? Oh, what wounds might be healed. Oh, what needs might be met. Oh, what glory might we see. Oh, what zeal for your service might we have. What boldness in front of a hostile world might we have. What steel in our spines might enable us to stand when everything else seems to be giving way. What a witness we could be. What a monument to your mercy. What a trophy of your grace. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name. O God, I pray that you would open my eyes as a blind, broken, needy pastor, sinner, who's in such desperate, constant need of you, like everybody else. I ask that you would do that work in my heart, that you would do that work in all of our hearts today. Those of us who are here, those of us who will watch later, I pray that you would open our eyes to see your glory as creator and redeemer, and that we would begin to worship you and live for you at a level we did not think was possible. We are missing out on so much victory and joy because we cling to the way things are or we cower before an uncertain future or we doubt your word. Oh, help us today. Forgive us where we falter and fail. Help us to glory in our weaknesses and to open ourselves up to you so that your strength can be on display through us. And make us a church that is transparent so that your glory can shine through in everything we do. In everything we do with one another and for one another and in everything we do for the community around us. We want your kingdom to grow. We want our body to grow. We want your glory to go far and wide. We want your fame to be lifted high. We want people in Glenmore to know there is a God in this place. Set us ablaze for your glory.
turn us inside out and upside down so that we begin to revolve around you as the blazing center. And then show us our marching orders for your kingdom and then unleash us to go and be used by you to do incredible things. Things we could never take credit for so that you get all the praise. And make us eager and excited to keep praying like this. And to keep walking forward with you. Help us, Lord. We need you. We need you. We give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.